uh, Alicia Morandu. Do I think Tall had an agreement with the other Soviet players to have quick draws in the candidates tournament? Are you talking about uh, Curacao? The tournament where Fisher famously complained about that? Hello, Tori Five Chess. Yeah, I think so, Pitch Bucket. Although I suspect Tall was probably less inclined to go for that. But if it was ordered by the Soviet authorities, which there's another great book called Russians versus Fisher. Which I, I think I have here. This one I definitely have. Yesterday I was I went on a wild goose chase to find that Super Nege book. This book is amazing. Russians versus Fisher. It's by Everyman Chess. Uh, it's by two Russian authors. Dmitry Plisetsky and Sergei Voronkov. Awesome, awesome book about all of Fisher's games with Soviet players. And there's a ton of inside information from the Soviet authorities, notes from the KGB, documents that came out, uh, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, about like the player profile that the Soviet state had on Bobby Fischer, Huge section on his 1972 match with Boris Spassky. Like, this is one of the better chess books I've ever read. It's kind of niche. I mean, you got to like the chess history stuff. But it puts the Cold War aspect of the game and Fisher's almost one-man rise to the chess crown in historical perspective. Oh, yeah, you've read that book, Book Move? Cool. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Let's go here. Let's try to keep some tension. Why is it Russians versus Fisher instead of Soviets versus Fisher? I don't know. Yeah, because all the games were played when, you know, it was the Soviet Union. Maybe they were trying to make it more inclusive. Oh, I missed a donation. Sorry about that. Uh, Fisgert with a thousand bits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fisgert. I think that's the donation in question. I appreciate that. Book costs 80 pounds on Amazon. Dang. All these books are fairly expensive. That is expensive for a book. I love books like that. Really well researched. There's some extremely well researched chess books. If you guys know the chess historian Edward Winter, uh, he has a website where he's documented a lot of stuff related to older chess history. Uh, on Twitter, there's a guy, I think he lives in Singapore. His name is Olympiu Urkan, uh, or Ursan maybe, U R C A N. He posts a lot of cool stuff related to uh, chess history. Doug Griffin as well on Twitter. Posts a lot of cool photos. Why did I take with the H pawn rather than the F pawn? Well, if I took with the F pawn there, then the pawn on E6 was going to be weak. So it'd be isolated, maybe even subject to direct attack like queen b3. So usually you want to take with the h-pawn in such a scenario, which also conforms to the standard of taking towards the center. To, to do this capture away from the center, you have, you have to have a really good reason to do it. Often the play down the f-file, which is not a big factor here. We're more interested in keeping a compact structure. Let's go rook d8. I'm thinking about maybe breaking through with this at some point, but first let's see if he's willing to trade. Place queen c2. Okay, so I could take and then go here. This pawn might be a little bit loose though. Thank you, Chessable Rookie, for the 25 months. Hey, good to see you. Thanks again. Hmm. Let's go rookie eight. 
We're not going to rush anything. And then immediate knight g3, okay. Now, I have half a mind to take and then play e5, but there is just this lingering issue of the a5 pawn if he takes with the queen. So I might want to go e5 instead. Yeah, e5 is probably decent here. Let's do it. In my experience, e5 is usually the break you want to go for in this position. c5 can be played sometimes, although it's a little bit wonky with this structure. I'd rather keep this pawn here to guard b5, let's say. It'll also help block the play down the file here. Takes. Okay, I'm going to take with the queen. This is where the rook being on e8 is helpful because I still have two defenders of this square. That's why I played that move. I think this position is pretty close to equal, though. He could play something like rook f d1, a semi-waiting move. He takes, though. Okay. Let's pre-move that. And Schnee, thank you for the tier one. I mean, arguably, I could think about this if he takes, but nah, it's not going to be good. So this is a safe pre-move. <laughs> yeah, respectable is going to depend on how you feel and what your personal goals are in the game. I mean, first of all, I think we should be playing this game to enjoy it and worry about raiding later. But if you want to set yourself a raiding goal, there's no, no harm in that. Knight d4 is interesting. So that knight is pretty well placed there. I'm thinking about c5. Even though I said I wasn't going to play this move, I don't think it's a good idea right now, but let's just say in the future, if I were to play it, take, get knight d3 in, and fork the queen and the rook. Thing is, my own queen drops off, so I'm not in a position to play that. Maybe rook here first? I'm going to do it. Support this. Maybe it's a prelude to doubling. There's just mostly maneuvering going on in this position. Plays rook d1, okay. So, could do that, but I kind of like doubling a little bit better. Yeah, let's double. Ben Gosha, thank you for subbing with Twitch Prime. Now, you could try to kick me back with his pawns, like f4. Something along those lines, but it, that might be weakening. If he pushes f4, this e-pawn will be undefended. Yeah, in that situation, you guys were asking about taking with the f-pawn earlier. Generally, you don't want to make that capture. Something people overrate sometimes because they think that they're going to get an attack down this file, but generally not a good idea. A little bit of a standoff here. That can happen. I feel like this position is slightly more pleasant for me. Like, ever so slightly. Mainly because of the c5 idea and the pressure down the file that he has to, to reckon with. It's not easy for him to push my, my pieces out of that file. But I also feel like with some accurate moves, he'll probably be just fine. Moves the knight back. So this might be the moment of truth if I want to play c5. Because it's possible I could win a pawn at the end of this line. Let's say he goes knight b5. I could trade everything down here. And then take on b2 at the end. There is a check here, but my king actually looks pretty safe. 
and his knight will be undefended. So I'm trying to forecast this a little further out because this could lead to some forcing play. You're not always going to try to look that far out. But if I play c5 and he moves his knight, I can get a double rook trade by force. So that's two, two and a half moves by force that I, I know can transpire. Like I can predict that future of the course of the game with certainty if his knight moves. I think it's pretty good. I don't see a reason not to play this move. I mean, he might go knight c3 or knight f4, but I would happily trade two minor pieces for a rook. So yeah, let's do it. This is well backed up. There's no surprises here, I don't think. So I think he's going to do this or this. Probably knight b5 if I had to guess. The other thing on knight b5 is I might play rook d2. That might even be stronger. To attack the queen and the rook here. So let's calculate that. Knight b5, rook d2. He should take rook takes... And then probably the only move is... Whoa, okay. So immediately stop calculating. He did something I wasn't expecting. <clears throat> yeah, take. Is there any reason not to take? Nah, I think we're just going to get the two miners now for the rook. Game's not going to be over yet. That's for sure, but... I'm liking this. If he checks here, I think the king is pretty safe over here. So we might be seeing two knights versus a rook or some permutation of that. Shamgar, hey, thanks for the 11 months. How you doing, Shamgar? Crusader, I'm doing well. How about you? It's been a good stream so far. Put together a few good streams lately. Team Horsey. Team Double Horsey. The only thing better than one knight is two knights. A pair of knights. Okay, take. Now, if takes, I wonder if he's going to go check here and then queen takes b7. I would actually love to see that because I think my pieces are going to come to life at that point. Knight in, attack the rook. It might be more likely that after this he plays rook d1. But that too, I, I like a lot. So let's let's do this. You see how handy this move has turned out to be. The fact that I have this window with my king. Again, if I had taken that way, my king would be a lot more open. Having to go to h f7. You generally want to get to the side of the board when there's like a major piece, a queen especially. Yeah, creating Luft for the king. Or Luft. Queen c3. So he's offering a queen trade. Now, generally, this is going to be a good trade because I'm up material. I'm up one point of material. I don't know how valid it is to turn down this trade. Well, I, I could think about it. I could definitely think about it because I don't want to take this pawn. I would lose my knight on e5. But this move might be possible. Eyeing up the rook. This is more ambitious. So... The decision whether I take here or not. Thank you, Sina Oyster, by the way. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thank you for watching. The decision whether to take or not is, is sort of determined by how confident I feel in winning this endgame. I feel pretty good about this because I, I think it'll be super tough for him to win a pawn. It feels like a technical win to me. If he takes with the rook, I'm going to go here. If he goes here, I'll, I can play knight b4. Feels like a position I should convert, but it's, it's not a walk in the park. It's not a trot around the barn. But two knights are going to be a lot better than a rook here when things are secure. K Buckby, hey, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks for your kind feedback. Okay. So he, he's playing with the idea of this. Now, I can move my rook here. This is what I, or my knight rather, here. 
So this is what I had in mind. And then play b6. Only thing is I wonder if he goes rook d5. I have knight b6. Oh my. K Buckby with the thousand. And also special cereal with the five dollars. Great, yes. Glad you're liking the educational streams. And K Buckby following up the thousand with the five gifted subs. Thank you, K Buckby. Let me uh try to make a good move here. This is this is probably a good try. I think he was wise to play this. I'm thinking about this. So if here I go here, rook d5, I go knight c4. Ah, but then he has b3. Hmm. Maybe I go here and then knight d6. No, but that's the same. I gotta move faster. Let's go ninety four. Hmm. If only my king was one square closer. I need it one square closer so that on knight d six, if he goes and attacks my knight, I could play king e seven. That would be perfect. But maybe I don't get it there. We'll see. Because now he goes rook d five. Okay, I can go knight c8, though. Knight, knight c8, rook d7. I already mentioned that line, didn't I? Man, tricky business here. I'm going to try this. I will try. <laughs> Rook d7. I can actually go here. This looks kind of insane to play this way, but that is an option. Might be the best winning attempt. I'm going to try it. Rook c7, I go here. I can also play this rook here. Rook b7, knight d5. Yeah. Now, I, I, next, I need to get my king in the game for sure. But the main thing is, I'm trying to defend both pawns. I don't want any trade of pawns here. I want to keep my pawns on board, which might run counter to what I'm usually describing and how to win these positions, guys. But if it liquidates down to it's just three versus three on the king side, that is probably a draw. Okay, now this knight defends. This knight is solid, so we're making progress. This is good. My clock situation is not good, but this is good. <laughs> Interesting ending. Let's go here. Maybe I should have played g5 first. I don't know. I need that king to come out soon. Ooh, he does that. Okay. Let's go here. <clears throat> if he checks, I'm going to go back. I'm going to do a little knight rearranging so I can get my king over. Still tricky though. King's coming over to help. Maybe even all the way up. King invasion. Knights hold everything, guarding the g8 square even. I can also play g6. Both knights will be defending those pawns. That's huge. Now the king is active. This knight on d5 is the glue. He has no breaks. He has nothing to attack. All the pawns are defended. Uh, let's take this one. King c4, I'll go check. Okay. Let's go here. 
This is winning. He's stuck. There's nothing to do here for him. He can't sack. He can't target anything. All he can do is wait. Run the pawns. That was a cool ending to this one. Just make sure we get the victory here, but that was really a lot of fun, this game. Okay. Wow, interesting double knight domination of the rook towards the end. Uh, K Buckby, thanks for the 500 bits. That knight maneuvering. Yeah, that was really pretty cool. Yeah, beautiful picture right here. The king can roam at will because the knights had everything under control. Mainly thanks to this centralized knight. And he was he was oscillating, he was rotating the rook, trying to find a target, but I hope that's clear to everyone why white is busted here. Just everything's defended. If he goes and attacks something with the rook, doesn't matter. Knight holds everything. So the king has freedom. I didn't plan it that way. But I was working really hard after we transitioned into the two knights versus the major piece ending to ensure that I could keep the pawns on. Because as I said, if these get liquidated, if these just get traded two for two, I think that's probably a draw. And I can still press with the two knights and three pawns versus rook and three. But generally for the defensive side, in a lot of endings, if you can, if you can localize the struggle to one area of the board and you don't have to worry about the other side of the board, that greatly increases your chance of drawing, even sometimes if you're down a point of material. That said, my opponent defended really well for a long time. He played some super annoying moves. I happened to get this arrangement. Now, the only thing that gives me pause around here is if white can get their king up quick enough to attack this knight on d5 before my king gets involved. I was a little uncertain right around about here Let's say he had played a move like maybe rook d7 at this point to stop king f7. That would have been tough. That would have been tough to find a plan. Maybe I play knight f4 and then bring the other knight to d5. But I would have a harder time. He needs to keep my king out, I think is the key. He needs to keep my king from getting over towards his rook. So I wonder if the computer will agree, because I felt like once we got once we got here, this was also a mistake, rook d7. Zobayan said that in the chat, rook d7 was wrong. Yeah, if he kept the rook here, I can't go king e6. Even if I go king e8, I can't approach yet. There's still a significant amount of work to do. Yeah, you should play something like king d d3. I do agree with Zobayan 100%. I felt that way in the game. Like once he played rook d7, the king had complete freedom. But let's check out, check out what uh, the engine says. Pause. Okay, so the raw stats on this one. My opponent, uh, six inaccuracies, two mistakes, one blunder for a t uh, 39 average centipon loss. I had one inaccuracy, one mistake, one blunder for a 23 average centipon loss. Ooh. And... Couldn't help but notice that these two moves are red. Yeah, rook d7 is definitely bad. <clears throat> Amazing how that skyrockets the advantage. This is suddenly minus four. <clears throat> Black is winning after this. But if that rook stuck around on d6, the engine thinks it's equal. And I should have played this knight up. Wow, okay. So that's what I was going for all along. But if he checks, what am I doing here? Am I giving the pawn? Maybe. King e6, rook takes g7, knight f4, go take this one. Let's see. Yeah. This looks less natural to do, but we go over here, we dart over here, we take a pawn. This is kind of similar to the game, because now the king has like broken the plane, and it can come over here without the rook intervening. I probably do the same knight arrangement or a similar one that I had in the game and try to get into the king somehow. Engine seems to think that this is close to winning. Subtle. 
Super subtle. What's the ultimate evaluation once we get into this ending? Okay, this is all a little bit better for black. Yeah, c5 is much better. It approves of all of this. All right. Ah, knight c6 first. That's sophisticated. Not even taking the pawn yet. I guess knight c6, you block the play down the file. <clears throat> and I have options how to take the pawn later. Maybe I'll even take this pawn if the queen gets deflected. That's pretty subtle. Yeah, this is a big decision whether I trade queens or not. In hindsight, given the difficulties I had in keeping the A and the B pawns on board, I would, in hindsight, I would not trade queens. I'd play something like queen f4 or I guess the engine likes queen d5. Queen f4 was more on my radar to eye up this and maybe this. So my proclivity for endgames was <laughs> maybe a little bit too much on display there. This is slightly better for black, but yeah, great accurate defense by my opponent, rook c5. Finding angles to attack my pawn in the, in the most annoying way, because if he goes rook b3, that's no problem. I can play knight b4, and the rook is just blocked here. But played rook b5 instead in that position, or rook c5 rather. Wow, I played this well. This took a lot of time. I mean, I can probably only justify this time usage in an increment game, but this is best. It's all about coordinating and trying to keep that beep on. Hmm. What does it want me to do here? Can't make up its mind between knight 6 and knight 8 to e7. I thought this was the most natural way to do it, unless I want to repeat. But yeah, I think his rook is annoying enough now, and my king is far enough away from the action that I, I don't doubt the engine's evaluation here. This is probably a draw if white plays it right. <laughs> I cannot confirm or deny that statement, Clown Master. Uh, draw your own conclusions. Yeah, I think this was also a slight mistake too, although the engine may not agree. I feel like I should play g5 first, because what if he had played h4 here? Wouldn't that be kind of annoying? Hmm, let's just play g5 anyways. Somehow aesthetically it looks better to play g5 and then f6 to control these squares. Ooh, and then g4 is weakening. Yeah, I could see how g4 hurt him, because... That gives me the f4 square permanently. So maybe g3 if he's going to... Wow, and now I need to play king g8 instead of king g6. There's actually a fairly large difference between the two. That's deep. King g8 and try to come out this way. I have a better chance. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I was analyzing before. Here, best is knight e to d5, allowing check and just give the g7 pawn. It kind of makes sense that the, the, the g7 pawn actually doesn't matter a whole lot because it's doubled. Its influence is lessened. And also the fact that I can go in the h pawn. And then I might have calmed the position down enough to, once I've got these guys defended, try to roam with the king and target the weaknesses. Interesting. But yes, after, after this mistake, as we're getting way down on the clock, both well under a minute here, after that mistake, I felt very confident with the king coming over. So he just needs to bide his time, king f3, and challenge me to get this in the, in the game. Because it's hard to unwind these knights. And king e8, there's no threat with king e8. I can't go here. He just waits. And even king e4, attack the knight. Then I, I even have to give way and allow that capture or... You know, this will be a mess. Who knows what will happen here? I'd probably rather take white. These pawns start to look more dangerous. Instructive ending. Very tricky ending. But yeah, I think this is a nice 
advertisement for fortresses and assessing how well you defend certain points. Computers are scary, yeah. <laughs> this is a win. Okay, real interesting game. Thank you guys for watching that. Maybe I'll post this one on YouTube. I feel like that was pretty instructive. So thanks again for watching.